Let's make art and let others tell the story. We can get so caught up into what we do, the work that we do, what others say. No, what are we supposed to do? What is the work that we do? And work really is art to me. So I think a job and a calling are two different things. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's where people get a little bit confused. We actually wanted to inspire you to take one step to actually being out there and writing the rules. So, hey, keep going, keep writing the rules. What is up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the New Rules Podcast. It's your girl, Breezy, here with the wonderful, incredible Mr. Christopher Adrian Crawford. <laughs> wow, full government name. I love it. Gotta <laughs> love it. What's up? All good things. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I am doing well. It is a nice afternoon as we are recording. It's a little cold in Tallahassee, but I'm here. But I am here for it. So. I've been in the indoors. Yeah, you've been indoors all day. But yes, yeah, a little bit cold outside. But you know, oh, yeah. that's why I love the. Uh, that's why I love the. I love this part of being in Florida is this time of the year right you're here. wearing a little f a little fur coat action hey chill so if, if you're not if you're listening I didn't even to the audio, notice that until if you, you said hold that on, if you listen to the audio like your boy's <laughs> not in here like I'm I'm you know I'm rocking like a <laughs> like you know your boy's got a big it's furry jacket you know? yeah. that goes all the way down to your feet <laughs> like I got like a Frank Lucas alpaca <laughs> right. fur on exactly. from American Gangster no, no that's no, no. exactly what he has on no 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 I don't just a little black jean jacket with a little bit of I don't even know if it's fur on the inside yeah, of uh, some wool or something on yeah, the inside of it. The, so, the sheep. <laughs> you know, something nice, something light for the people today. So Okay. Well, <laughs> you know, this podcast <laughs> exists to equip individuals to write new rules through unlocking authenticity because we believe that it leads to human flourishing. If we have added any value to you, we ask that you would please give us a shout out, leave us a review. Most importantly, would you please share our content and give us a follow, or I, I guess it's technically a whatever it's called on LinkedIn. Yeah, I don't know yeah. what it is. Yeah, add, add us. Add us, like <laughs> add us on LinkedIn at, like, yeah. at Adrian Crawford. <laughs> <laughs> um, and let us know how this content has impacted you. Yeah, we've gotten some good feedback lately for some people who've actually been like not only listening to Pod, but then some of our practical application been doing it, seeming to help them. So, man, uh, let us know if the pod has been helping you. What are some things you've been doing? Have you seen it uh, uh, work? But also, if you're listening for the first time, we do give you practical application. want to encourage you to try to take it, do it, apply it, because uh, we really do this of some time and some tested stuff that we actually not only use here but we use with our clients as well and those we help uh, see develop so man make sure you let us know boom all right well with that being said Bree, what we got today today's topic is a little spicy oh boy here we go every topic is a little spicy because that's who we are but today's is a particularly controversial topic, okay. especially in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's one that we are very passionate about. Uh, we both, so if we, if we sound intense on this episode, <laughs> it's just because this is what we think about at night, yes. <laughs> late at night, yep. just pondering on all, you know, the different <laughs> opinions <laughs> and narratives regarding this topic. Today, we're talking about work. Work, 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 work. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <Cue> <laughs> stress. Everyone's just sweating. Like, even the sound of that word, yeah. people just start to have panic attacks about. Panic attacks, start <laughs> freaking out, you know, past experiences. But, I, but I'm starting to think that unless you're like a boomer and like a Gen X on here, yeah, I mean, I should say not all millennials, not all Gen Z, but I, but again, it shouldn't cause like panic. I just think it's like it's the panic of the what ifs now. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? It's kind of it. So, and there's also this kind of existential dread. Yeah. For this, I have to do this for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if you're listening to this, we just ask primarily that you keep an open mind, um, because uh, our hope is that we kind of give you a new perspective to yeah. what it means to work. Mm -hmm. Um, you were talking, I just thought about something else. I did hear somebody say that they feel like we crap on Gen Z a lot. 
in our podcast. What? And they said that to me. I was walking around the grocery store. Uh, you know, I was like, <laughs> like, I love the podcast, but you know, I showed it to somebody else, and they felt like all you did was talk crap about Gen Z. And I Are said, you kidding? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I'm like, oh my gosh. So, I'm just letting you know if that's you and you listen to this, <laughs> you have like go back, go to our cast. We got receipts because that you have selective memory. How many times do I have to say how, how much I believe in this generation? <laughs> it's the reason why I have a podcast trying to talk to this uh, generation. And you know, I didn't tell you because I was like, man, this is going to throw him. Oh, <laughs> I'm man. Like, this no. Is gonna- <laughs> it, listen, here's what I've come to realize. Listen, as a guy who pre like who like has preached the Bible for the last 20 years, like, and people will just say stuff of like, hey, yeah, I think you believe this. And you're like, have you ever listened to me talk ever? <laughs> like, it's just like you just come to realize, like, what do I prepare for? Because right. most of the time people are like, they're going to hear what they want to hear. That's right. what you come to realize. No, in that moment, I felt what you always feel. It was the first time it's really ever happened to me where it was like, when you say you, you're you're talking about me too. Yeah, yeah. And I felt like the imposter syndrome of like, do I hate Gen Z? Dude. And then I'm saying like, wait, what am I, ta- what am I even thinking about right now? Anyways. There we go. Okay. We love Gen Z. You guys are great. You're awesome. Amazing. And we hope, yeah, we just, just. You got it, buddy. Keep going. <laughs> you, got, you got it, buddy. <laughs> you got it, buddy. Keep going. Um, okay, so um, today's uh, today's topic really is inspired by Rick Rubin, mm-hmm. um, an iconic person. If yep. you could share a little bit um, about him and how kind of his work influenced you to come up with the title of our topic today, which is Let's Make Art. Rick Rubin, again, his book, The Creative Act, has been a really uh, important book I've read this uh, year. Um, it's kind of something I read daily, just taking my time to read through it uh, more from a leadership and kind of creative kind of daily routine that I've been doing. Uh, he's, he writ the, he, he, the book was written to be like slowly digested, not to be sped read through, but to actually take your time and to be able to try to process what actually he said. And he makes a statement where he says, let's make art and let others tell the story. And what he was ultimately getting to is that we can get so caught up into what we do, the work that we do, and how it comes off and what it's saying and what it's speaking and how are people going to portray the work we do, how they're going to portray our job we do. And now he's talking of it from an actual creative standpoint or when people are making music or maybe maybe making a piece of art or whatever. But I actually believe work is actually art. And, and in that, I think that it's really spoke to me because so many times we can be so consumed always about what others say, you know what I mean, about or or us portraying a certain thing instead of just being like, no, what are we supposed to do? What is the work that we do? And work really is art to me. And then let whatever, however it falls, let it fall. Let people tell the story from it. And so I found it really interesting and really compelling. And it made my mind start going on this road of just this idea of work. What do you believe the general consensus on work is? Mm -hmm. Why do you think that? that is and can you share a little bit about how it differs from your perspective yeah i think that work is kind of seen as a necessary evil um i think it's something that we have to do to make money to pay bills um now i think that the enjoyment of work has kind of been a topic of conversation a lot more um i think guys like gary vanderchuk you know gary v uh has done a, a really good job of talking about the idea of like of, of trying to find what you do well and, and going in those lanes and, and, and there's so many more, more opportunities to, to work and trying different like from you know different avenues now that we have the opportunity to do. But I also just still think that that's what people do, that they want to find something maybe they can enjoy, but then in the end they have to do it in order to make money, in order to kind of go into, uh, to be able to fund whatever lifestyle, the things they really like to do outside of that. Um, and, and I just have a different perspective of that, of work. Now, again, um, I, like I say this and unapologetic about it, that most of the way that I view things or almost all the ways that I view things first and foremost, start from like a biblical lens. Now, unfortunately that a lot of times when people hear that they have all types of thoughts about that, because I think sometimes how it's communicated or how it's not properly applied into the world. But my idea of work really does come from a very like, you know, kind of like a biblical view. And, and what I believe in that is that I believe work is actually a gift. Um, I believe work is not like a curse. I don't believe work is like, oh, man, it's a necessary evil. It doesn't mean it's not hard, but I believe work is a, is a real gift. And I believe that the work that we do can be a beautiful thing and it can create art no matter what you're doing, no matter what type of job you have. Um, but I think what we have and we've talked about this a lot on this pod, I think we've all chased this idea of like a job instead of a calling 
And I think that's the difference. I think a job and a calling are two different things to me. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that's where people get a little bit confused because I think that if you're just chasing a job, then, yeah, you're going to struggle if, man, maybe you have a greater aspiration than to just be maybe a state uh, working a minimal, you know, kind of a a low entry position in the state in a state agency or, you know, you're working right now and you're kind of a data, you know, data analyst and you're kind of in a junior position. Maybe you you uh, you know you have desires to 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 move up in organizations to work in higher more uh, executive C suite levels, but I think that's when you're chasing a job. And so we think that once we find that job, that job's going to be it and it's going to satisfy us. Versus realizing, I believe any job that you have, if you start to understand calling, then I think you can really function well and create art no matter where you find yourself. Do you think that by having a greater understanding of that calling, it removes the grunt work? Oh, no. I think that that's just part of it. It's not that everything is enjoyable. But I think that, I mean, you find people, I mean, I love basketball um, when I was playing. And there was a lot of parts of basketball, like the workouts and the conditioning and um, watching film that wasn't enjoyable. It was like a grind. You're like, God, I don't want to watch film today, right? But it was all a part of helping develop so that when I actually got to the part that I love, which was like the game, you know, when you got to the game, when you got to the, you know, the live action, when you're with your teammates, man, you could actually perform and make beautiful art because you've done all the preparation work. I guarantee you it's not, I don't know what all goes into a painting, you know, but I don't know if an, you know, an artist is that they're, you know, getting their paints together. They're trying to pick out the canvas and they're doing that. I don't know. Do they love all of that? Maybe, but I don't think so. I mean, I know that people who make music, they don't love, you know, shout out to my man Grady behind the camera. <laughs> Grady you know Escobar. what I'm saying? You know, hurry up and get back on the Spotify. mic. Spotify, we've know. been waiting. We've been waiting. The people, the people need Grady back. But anyway, but if I, you know, but when you're out there and you're, you know, and I've heard this from musicians, it's not like, man, the tedious parts of like, man, listening to beats and does this beat work? Some people like that. Some people don't. Some people just like, you know, if they're a rapper, just to lay down the verse, or some people just the vocals. So I think there's just tedious, hard parts of work that are there. Um, but I think that those, when you actually have a bigger understanding, it makes it tolerable. I think when you don't have a bigger understanding of what you're doing, everything will seem tedious. All of it will seem just like this, all this grunt work that's there. And the grunt work many times is, is what helps you actually produce really, really good art and makes you really become more productive because you get to see all the intricacies of things. In the, the work that we do, especially in corporate, a lot of what we hear people say are things like people just don't want to work anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what do you think about that? Do you think I, that's true? I think that a lot of times when people say that, when we hear it, it's from upper management who normally their like culture sucks and people don't want to work for them. Or it's people who have this perspective to then they'll blame like, you know, it was like, it was, I'll never forget, this was like, this was like almost six, eight months after the government stopped giving checks during COVID. And people were like, well, people aren't going back to work because of, man, you know, the government's giving checks. I'm like, they haven't given people checks in like six to eight months. That's not why people aren't going back to work. People just reconsider things. I think people, I think, here's the deal. I think there's some people. And I think there, and again, I, I can't go off percentages of how many people want to work and don't want to work or whatever. I think what it comes down to is that we don't tie work to something greater. So I think that for people, yeah, I think they will struggle because they don't see it being anything greater. Like, I don't think someone woke up one morning and said, hey, you know what I want to do? All I ever want to do is, you know, and again, this is not a knock on this, but like if somebody's working at, you know, let's say at a, uh, what I think, I think they call it fast five, the oil changes or whatever, right? There's nothing wrong with that. That's beautiful. Some people woke up, I mean, they love working on cars. That's all they want to do. That's great. But I don't think everybody did that. But then what ends up happening is that we can, you know, not everybody just wants to always go through life and just like, okay, well, I just have to pay my bills. So let me just go to work. Like, yeah, I think people don't like that. But I think if we could do a better job of tying that to something bigger and not everybody's going to take that. But I think it's the responsibility of those who are in leadership to actually step in and be able to help people tie it to something that is 
far, you know, give them something of a futuristic kind of plan. Help them see how what they're doing now can tie into something more in the future. Help give them like a, a track to develop and to grow, to move forward. I think when you do those things and you start helping them point out their own personal skills, help them discover those, then say, hey, man, no, really apply those skills. I think people would find life and joy a little bit more when they're actually seeing their actual strengths work in something. Because if all they can just see is the job in front of them and you don't help them tie their actual real God-given skills to that job, it's just going to always be something that's that's going to be miserable because what they're going to do is just look at everybody else and how did somebody else do this job? And so, you know, if somebody else did this job and they were really organized, but I'm not really organized, but I'm a creative, then they're going to think, okay, they're going to keep trying to be organized and it's just going to be like dread for them. But maybe their creativity can actually help them be better at their job. Mm-hmm. Something that Dr. Zoda has mentioned mm-hmm. to us before is that he read it in a book. I can't, I can't remember the book, but we can link it um, after the podcast. So if you think of the mechanics of work, Mm -hmm. like the science of work, and you think of the art of work, kind of how you bring yourself to it. To me, it seems like corporate America has heavily overemphasized the science of work. So there's a huge tight system that people are supposed to rinse and repeat. Mm -hmm. And it takes away any um, self differentiation that people can bring to the table, which kind of takes away that passion, the the sense of self and makes it feel like this isn't actually my art. I'm just making something that reflects a lot more of what you want. Yeah. Um, The first thing would be, do you agree with that? And the second thing was do you think that that is actually beneficial to corporate brands that have to kind of keep a tight narrative Mm -hmm. around who they are or do you think that there's a way where you can have both yeah i think there's a way you can have both it's just a little bit it's just have to do a little bit more work I think there needs to be you have to i mean the bigger you become you know as an organization um the more policies you have to have in place because you have just way more bodies right you you can't leave everything up to where you have direct contact with everyone um but i also believe that it's a little bit more work i think what you can do so i would say this is that you have to then know what's the main things like in this area for our you know building this product our branding you know like we these are non-negotiables right but hey but you got room to do this you know i love how um I think he passed away. Tony Shea, who was the uh, he was the founder of Zappos, um, and one of the things that Zappos was known for the shoe uh, kind of the online shoe company was that for their customer service. And one of the things that they did was that they were just I mean they were known for their incredible customer service, like where they would have like uh, you would call in. And people got to a point, you know, nobody really wants to call in to places, right? You don't want to call a 1-800 number. You don't want to talk to customer service because it's usually automated or people are rude or whatever. But what they would do is people would come in and they would they would find out like, hey, you know, I got this, man, my wedding. Uh, I got sent the wrong shoes. My wedding is in two days. And so they gave their uh, employees freedom and financial freedom to like, oh man, overnight something like that. And then they would also send like a, like, hey, uh, a wedding gift or something like that. Um, you know, just things like that. Or if they, hey, I, something, you know, there's a story about somebody I believe like it was a funeral. And, you know, they, you know, heard about that. And then they actually sent, you know, they sent flowers, you know, to that from like the Zappos team. So, but they were very, also some very clear, I believe, some very clear like protocols too as well. So I think you can do it. You just have to do a little bit more work. Um, and I think if these are things that I think uh, people got to begin to think about if they want to continue to, uh, you know, recruit people to come in their workforce, because people do want a little bit more individuality in their work nowadays. And I don't think that's bad. But I also know that you're going to have to do it just can't be how it was before. Let's because it's very easy once you get the system to just manage the system. But I think it's a whole different thing when you have to just constantly tweak the system. You have to give people room, you know, and that takes that takes a little bit more work, a little bit more intuition and stuff that has to happen from your team, a little bit more training. Hmm. When well, you yourself are a CEO, you've ran multiple businesses. Mm -hmm. So with that idea of, you know, people just don't want to work anymore as a leader of yeah. many businesses do you ever find yourself feeling that same way even if it's from a from a different perspective yeah i think people they want say this way 
they want certain outcomes. They want equal outcomes than other people. And that's not reality. Um, meaning that, yeah, you can work 40 hours a week and there's nothing wrong with that. But then understand you probably will not advance or, or you know, once you're off, you're off. You don't want to have to do anything with work. Then that means you probably want to advance in any type of executive level within the organizations I lead. Because when you're at those levels, like it's, you know, we are all about having like, you know, the ability if we, you know, like your time's off and your time's off. But like, here's the truth about it. Like when you're in an executive level, you are the adult in the room. So like if all of a sudden the house is on fire, you can't just be like, well, hey, it's my time off. So sorry. Like, no, like you have to step up and do that. And you have to show that that's what you want to do. It's not wrong if you don't, but you also cannot expect it and make the same money, have the same influence or the same impact as someone who does want to do that. And so I don't think it's that people won't they're not willing to like work at it. I just think that it's people have a really, really big like kind of a different they want the same outcome as other people. Well, hey, I put in four hours. That's what I'm paid for. You know, that's the one thing you hear. Well, I'm paid for 40 hours, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm like, you're right, and you'll get paid for 40 hours. If they want me to do more, they'll, then they'll do that. And you're right, they they can. Or the, somebody, the, there may be a person who says, you know what, man, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get paid that, but I know I'm going to get some experience from that. That person's going to have a little bit more favorable, like uh, kind of uh, uh, more attention from like the boss or the person who's their direct report. It's just life. Like, I just, I think, that is a, and this is not me as a Gen X person or somebody older just saying this. I just think it's life. And I feel a responsibility to not be the person that just craps on, you know, like the next generation, but also to help them face reality, man. Like you, if you want to have a, a quote unquote work life balance, which I think is a unicorn you're chasing, then that's okay. But don't crap on the next person, the next man or the next woman for doing that. And also don't expect to get what they get. It's just life. It is just what it is. And and I think that that's really, really important. So I think that's people will work. I just think that they want the same outcomes, you know, uh, just because they put in 40 hours and they want the same outcomes or the same opportunity as somebody who put in 60 hours. And I just don't think that's reality. In the beginning, we talked about the quote, let's make art and yep. let others tell the story. Yep. And that's an example of how as a leader of this organization, you've decided this is the requirement in order to make proper art here yeah. and you fundamentally believe that mm. and there are stories that people can tell about you yep. because of it yep. um, can you share a little bit about that and share if you've ever felt any shame towards your beliefs oh gosh I, I so far let's go with the last thing you said 100% I feel shame I come from a time to where I, I saw hard work with my very own eyes, right? I've told the story before. I watched my father, and I saw how my father worked. I watched my mother, the stay-at-home mom, how she worked. You know what I'm saying? Even at home, like, I mean, she worked. Um, it's like, even when I would, like, you know, my mom was like, it wasn't like my mom was just at home, like, chilling. You know what I'm saying? Or my mom was out there, you know, doing, like, you know, Pilates all day or something like that. My mom was like, you know, I mean, the house, I mean, my house was never, like. I'm just picturing, like, uh, your mom at uh, Pilates. I know. Like. It's just like, you know, tear, like, I have so many thoughts. But <laughs> but, um, but it was one of those situations to where, like, no, she, uh, I watched my both my, my family, like, really, really work. So I think sometimes I feel shame because when I start talking like that, it can easily, I get put in a box, right? Um, because I think as, at times, because I've learned how to work and, and working through those processes, it's had some impact on me physically, you know, as we've talked through. Um, and sometimes people can just like, you know, have conversations of like, well, you know, you know, if I have more, more balance than this and that, I'm like, well, I didn't want that. I didn't want that. I, I, I don't want that. Um, and, you know, then people start making assumptions. We're like, hey, your children, and what about this? And I'm like, I'm like, what about them? I'm like, I, me and my wife have a responsibility for my children. And, and I have friends of mine who help keep me in check if I get out of balance. But I think I can feel shame because I'm always like everybody else's perspective. But what I really realize is that for th I am built to get out of people what they don't think is inside of them. And that is just when I'm at my absolute best. And so at times that's really good for people. And there's a lot of stories of people who will come back and say like, man, when I was, I didn't understand it or man, they did understand, they trusted it and they went through it and they say, man, they're incredible. Or the stories I love the most is people who go into work for other people. And they ask me the question like, man, how do you develop people like that? 
that's the part for me I love. That's the story because we created an intense environment because of what we're trying to develop. I'm not trying to develop people who just want to be okay. I want to develop people who really want to maximize uh, who they are. Um, and that doesn't, and that doesn't mean you're going to be, oh man, you're going to be on Forbes, you know what I'm saying? Or anything like that. But what I will say is that I want to help people maximize whatever their, whatever their lid is. I want them to maximize. Like I want them to like, you know, to fill that cup all the way up, you know, I mean, why not? We have one life. Why not maximize your ability? And that does not have to be in the workspace. That may be, man, you work for a little while and then you realize, man, I just want to invest this time right now in this stage with my kids. But you know what I want you to be? Maximum potential knowing who you are um, and being able to use your skills and gifts to help maximize the life of your kids. I want that. And so I just have got to a place that I'm unapologetic. Uh, I'm becoming more and more unapologetic about that. And and so I'm, I'm not for everyone. To work for me is not for everyone. And that's okay. They're not bad. They're not wrong. But also I'm not bad. I'm not wrong for it either. Mm-hmm. Have you ever – Minima, minimalize the lid of your organization and attempt to maximize the lid of individuals that work for you. 100%. Um, and that's one of the biggest shifts I think is happening right now inside of me. Um, I recently was reading the book of, um, of Unreasonable Hospitality. And there's a story that goes into that book, which has been a phenomenal book to read of how when a a gentleman took over a restaurant and he makes a statement and he says that my responsibility is to the restaurant first, um, not to you. But I believe that to do right by the restaurant is to do right by you. But the only way I can do right by you is by doing right by the restaurant. And that really has been shifting for me because I think at times because I really am a people person. I really care about the individual because I believe individuals make great organizations. So I, that's why I care so much about the individual, but what I've realized at times I have sacrificed, um, the impact of the organization for the individual. And what that leads to is there's more individuals that can actually be impacted because of that. And so, um, and I've also realized some of that is my own codependency as well, because though I love and care for people at times, I want to just, I've said it before, I want to be liked by people so much and that can hinder, and that's not healthy as well. Cause underneath that, what that is is self-worship. You just want people to just worship you. And so now what I've, um, kind of moved towards and what I'm moving towards, it's like, no, I've got to think about what's the best for the organization. And I know that because the organization is made up of people, I'm going to do right by people. Uh, but I've got to do that. And it's kind of hindered the impact, I think, at times. But I, but um, there, has been, there has been really good impact, but I think there could have been more. Um, and I think this part of my life, you know, starting at being at 45, is that, man, like I really want to make as much impact as I can. So I have to do what's best for the organization. Why do you think that hearing that in unreasonable hospitality touched you in a way that caused you to make more movement because i would i yep. you can correct me if i'm wrong mm-hmm. correct me if i'm wrong but that's not a concept that's necessarily foreign to you but for yep. whatever reason it hit you different this time i think it's just a phase of life that i'm in and a lot of times that's what happens i start to hear messaging multiple times and normally when i hear messaging multiple times it's just the next season of life i'm going in Like, it wasn't like what I was doing before was bad or wrong or even, like, not good. It was. But I think that, um, yeah, I just think it's that time. And I also think, too, you know, when you hit certain parts of your life, you know, you're like, man, I mean, you know, God willing, I've got, you know, 20, 25 years left in me, you know, to really work. I want to do that. Like, I'm not the guy like, oh, man, I can't wait to get to 65 and whoo, be able to retire. Like, no, like, I just, I don't. I don't see my life like not doing something making impact. Um, but but when you get to that part of your life, you're like, man, oh, okay, like it, the, the stakes are going up. You know, you're like, man, like, you know, you always feel like you had more time. Um, but now you're like, no, like, I don't know. I mean, I mean, again, I hope to live a really, really long life. I mean, I hope I'm at 45. I hope I'm just like just literally at like halftime. You know what I'm saying? But it's also like, but there's no guarantees. So for me, I'm like, man, how do I maximize every day to make the maximum amount of impact for individuals? And I believe to make the maximum amount of impact for individuals, it has to be an organization that is really leading to make that type of impact as well. Mm-hmm. In New Rules, we are highly creative, mm-hmm. and that's one of 
one of the ways that we add a lot of value to the corporate space yep. is because we're not very traditional and so it, it adds to the disruption that we do within that space um because of that we work with a lot of creatives you yourself are a creative yeah and uh, typically people with that skill set would view any form of structure or discipline as a, a negative impact to their creative process. And I would say that that is a view definitely of a majority of the younger generation. Mm -hmm. um, forms of tight forms of structure or discipline will kind of suffocate who I am. Yep. And that's what I, I think that ties into some of the negative view of work. Yep. As a creative, what's mm -hmm. your take on how structure and discipline has actually helped you flourish? It's helped me a lot because I think you need to have channels to push your creative energy. Um, I think that if you just live in the abstract, right, like, you know, just kind of like random, just out there. I'm like, I, I mean, some people are that way and great. I'm not. I need to push towards something. You know, I heard somebody say it this way. You know, we always say, like, think outside the box. And, like, you're like, mm, that's kind of dumb a little bit. Um, I get what they're saying. And I always used to say this. When I say it, think outside the box, and when I, when I think that really is meaning, think outside of the box that you're in that may not fit you, but you're going into another box because you have parameters. And then be as creative as you can be in those parameters because you really can solve real problems. I think because we can just, you know, get abstract. And I think here's what happens, I think, sometimes with, like, with creatives. Creatives don't learn the muscle to work. They don't learn the muscle of the grind of it because sometimes some of your best art can come after man, not because it always just feels right to do it. It's just, man, you just kind of like, you know, you, you work, you work, you work, you turn it over, you turn it over, you, you're frustrated. Sometimes it doesn't feel right. I mean, I, you know, when I speak, whether it is a sermon I'm speaking or I'm speaking in front of an organization, I consider that art. I really am creative around like kind of how I approach it. And in that, Man, there but there was multiple, multiple years and even times now where like I have turned that over and it's just like, man, you're just you're fighting and it's hard work and you're kind of in this box and I'm like, man, I wish I could do this and, and a lot of times learning that muscle to get something done. I think there's a lot of creatives who limit the impact they can have in the world because they haven't heard, they haven't learned the muscle to finish something through. Um, I had a mentor of mine say something to me one time and he was like, man, the thing I always see with you, and this is when I was in my twenties, he was like, you're the guy who, who wants to see the watch. Like you would love it. Like he, he's, he's like, I, I see you as somebody who looks at this very complex kind of watch. Right. And, and in this watch, he was like, what you want to do is break the watch apart and just see how the watch works. You just want to see how it works. But he's like, but actually what I think you're called to do in your life is to make it work. Mm -hmm. Not only see how it works, but to make it work. And man, that was, it was like one of those like moments where like, you know, you have these pivotal moments in your life that change your life. And that was a pivotal moment that changed my life because what I realized was that I was a guy always talking about creative ideas and, and always dreaming, but never fully putting them into action. And that moment, and thankful I was like in my mid twenties, it flipped something in me to make me start putting work into action. Hmm. This is a little bit of a sharp term. <laughs> Still right. on the topic of work. Still on the topic of work. Let's do it. Throughout history, we have seen a lot of examples of how people in power have actually used work to demoralize people mm -hmm. and strip dignity away from people. For sure. And I think that is some of why, especially the younger generation, has a lot of hesitation towards work as well mm -hmm. due to the, you know, trust of authority and, yep. and some of the social values that the generation typically has. Yep. I mean, one example, a bigger example is obviously slavery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An even more minor example that recently happened would be the FSU football decision mm -hmm. that kind of takes the work and the grind of young men mm -hmm. and strips away. Yeah their purpose and, and everything that they put into it in an unfair and unequal way. Yeah. How do you think that you have brought dignity back to work mm. for the people who work for you? Huh. A good question. Um, I think that I've done this by 
helping people figure out who they are and then how that really applies. Because I think that my job is to, I mean, again, is to create an environment where people can really flourish. And I think that when people are here and they see that, man, like I really do think about them and put them first um, as far as like helping them find out what they're hardwired to do, put them in those things, give people room, I think as well to like, uh, to work on things, you know what I'm saying? That's maybe not in their, their wheelhouse. I think I, um, you know, the things I say I value, here's the other, the things I say I value, I think it's embodied. You know, that's one of the things we say. I think we have a credible culture. You know, we define that as a, as where the values of the organization is, it's, it's embodied, it's felt by the employee experience. And I think that people can tell, like, you know, around here, I mean, I, I you know, the idea, we talk about authenticity and um, we talk about, rec, you know, reconciliation. We talk about, you know, family and, um, you know, leadership development, all that like, I think people feel that. I think they experience that. I think they know, like, I care about their development. That's why I give people room to go to therapy during work hours, you know, and they don't have to take a lunch to do that. They just, you know, hey, if you got a set, go, go if, you know, as long as you got your schedules, you know, your work done, or, you know, you're getting, you know, you got your day planned out, whatever, go for it. I don't ever stop that or, you know, or, or somebody needs, you know, they need to go watch their kids, you know, events, you know, that they have, like, you know, grandparents day and all that stuff like that. I'm like, man, for sure, go. Um, I think that people see that and I think that's kind of brought dignity to the, to the work. I also think that what I've also done, I've been honest too. I don't lie about it. I don't lie about the grind. I don't lie about the expectation. And I also challenge people when they live in the, like I like to call it the what ifs, the shadows, right? They live in the shadows of what it could be. And I pull that out. That's what a lot of people I think struggle. You mentioned it, like, man, things that have happened, people who have seen the work, like the uh, their work abused or asked to work X amount of hours more and, and they heard those stories. But what happens sometimes, that's never happened to some people in their experience. Mm-hmm. They live off of other people's experience. And so what they do is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. They, anything they feel may be, some type of like work, like abuse or man, they're, they're asking me to work an extra couple hours. They, man, this, this is a toxic environment. I'm like, no, it's not. That's not true. You know? And so I try to help people like deal in their experience and not let their anxieties or their fears kind of push some future thing that hasn't happened yet. So I think those are some of the ways. I mean, I would ask you, how do you feel like I've done it? I think that you explained it exactly. In my words, I would say that you have taught me how to know who I am Mm -hmm. and because of that have a vision for my life that is aligned with my skill sets but also pushes me out of my comfort zone. Hmm. And you hold me accountable to that. And you've never required something... I think of me or of anybody who's worked here without giving such a strong vision that is truthful and honest Mm. and really explained why it's beneficial for the organization and also for the individual. Mm. I think you do. I mean, an incredible job, incredible job with that for sure. Appreciate that. No, that's actually, that was a very good question. I've never really like thought about like that. You know, I think I never thought about like, man, do I bring like dignity to work? You know, I just think it's, I just like work, you know what I'm saying? Like, I I think the work that we present is just like, it's, it's real work. You know, I think the dignity of work is when somebody presents what the real work is, the real cost of it, what you're going to do, um, the opportunities you can have, um, no one like lying to you. Oh man, like, you know, Hey, you can work, man, this is going to be the greatest job, man. You can work remote six days a week, you know, like five days a week and never come in and work only five hours a day. And you're going to advance to become like a COO one day. I'm like, you're lying. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, or that if, if somebody's saying that to you, that company will not exist, you know, in a couple of years. So I think that like, I think the the dignity of work comes from just like, man, this is just the honesty of it. Yeah. And I think it's a great thing to continue pondering because we live in a world where, like you said, there there is a little bit of a victim mentality and I guess a shared trauma per se. That's yeah. not that's not the appropriate word, but where people kind of take on the stories that they've heard yep. as if it's been what they have experienced. Yeah, yeah. And as a as a leader, as an as someone in a position of power, I do feel like, and and we've seen this with a lot of the people that we work with. Hmm 
there is such a fear to make decisions because they are so scared to be viewed as the person who manipulates a people for their own gain. Yes. And uh, I think when you really, it's, it's really hard to think about the ways that you don't do that because the anxiety of being viewed that way is so scary mm-hmm. and so shameful, even if that's not at all who you are. Yep. Because the, people's perception of you matters, especially if you're someone who feels deeply. Yep. And so the reason why I ask is because I think it's really critical for people to think through the ways that they do disrupt things in mm. a good way, yep. even if the narrative feels different because you hear the bad thing that people say. Yeah. They, they just hit you so much deeper than than the good things. Yeah. And I'm, I think that you really have, for me, you, you really have brought a wholeness to work mm. that is honestly really hard to put words to. Well, no, I and I appreciate you saying that. And it, it is, it is hard. I mean, like, especially one of the, like, spaces I'm in. Like, being in the church space is hard because, unfortunately, churches don't, like, oh, like, like as a whole, now I know I've got friends and I've got plenty of people who, let me be careful, say this, like do this, like where they're, they work hard. But man, one of the most underworking places like is like is the church. And it's the expect it's not the people, it's the expectation of the leaders. It's this false narrative that like, oh man, like it's the church and it's for God and we should do this. I'm like, that means we should probably work harder if you feel like you were literally doing work for God. Like the greatest boss. <laughs> you think like, hey, you know what? I think I think he's okay with us as being okay. You know, like like no, like you should work hard. You should hold a standard. You should have like, you know, you should have a deliverables that you do. You should if you got something that's you know, our team knows this. If you got something that's due, I expect it to get done. I don't care if you stay up all night, because here's the reason. It's because people who pay their who give tithe to help see the church to do the things that do, they have deliverables. So why shouldn't you have deliverables? And I think it's an insane, I mean, like, it drives me nuts, especially I see younger people who are getting into the context of ministry who think that they, that, like, literally somebody's paying you to read your Bible. Like, no, that's what people do because you're a follower of Jesus, not to get paid to do that. It's the dumbest thing and I, and I don't tolerate it. That's not what you get paid to do. You know, it, that's, and, and I think that this is incredibly important because that is where if I do take flack sometimes, I take flack for that because of the expectation I have in the church world. And it's, and you know, because people can so easily out of their own anxiety, their own insecurity, and their own stuff inside of them, it challenges them. It makes them feel insecure that the expectation of like, oh, well, you know, you know, it's you're, you're doing it from a wrong motive and a wrong heart and a wrong spirit. And I'm like, have you ever read your Bible in your life? Like, like people who we rave, like the Apostle Paul, like, like would literally like he would work all freaking day with his hands, making tents. He had a business and then he would go do all the ministry stuff all night. And this is his life. People would be mad at Paul saying Paul didn't have a work life balance. Like, I mean, are you freaking kidding me? Like it just, it is, it is an absurd conversation. And I think that that's one of the biggest things I feel a responsibility for is bringing dignity to work, especially when I'm working in a Christian space. Uh, I think it's gotten better, but I still think it's very limited. Sorry. That's a complete tangent. (laughs) And that's like one of those like soapbox things, but it just, it drives me it drives me up a wall, man. And it's like, and, and everybody just has all these opinions about people and all these, and anybody who has any bit of like passion, desire, ambition for anything, that something's wrong with them and they're, they're leaning from the wrong place. Mm-hmm. But nobody says that about you when you're freaking lazy. Nobody says that to you when you like, you know what I'm saying? Like when, when you go to work and you halfway do stuff and it's just, oh, well, I'm, I, you know, it seems way more spiritual because I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm letting, you know, I'm kind of resting in God. What does that mean? Like, really, what does that mean? What you have done is now taking the Bible to fit your stupid narrative. Sorry. Anyway, keep going. Well, I think part of what you're explaining too, or at least as you're talking, I'm thinking about how it's the you're damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Because even if you say that with confidence and you have such a clear understanding of the value that you do provide and the dignity that you do bring to work and the things that you haven't done, even the confidence in that almost like publicly begs the question of like, but do you not listen to people? Are you like, there's like this 
immediate critique even to yep. having confidence in that um, that I think adds to the insecurity and the shame of it all.